All right, let's get started. Welcome back, and thank you for coming today. I know we have a few guests, so welcome. This is Faces and Places in Fashion here at FIT. Um, for those of you in the class, just a quick uh, couple of house cleaning things. I did finish grading all of your event critiques, so um, if you have any questions, you can let me know. I know there was a one or two issues, so if that's still the case, please let me know so we can take care of that as soon as possible. Um, also, next week, just as a reminder, Kristen Sevilla will be our speaker. She is the president of Jour Access, which is the premier uh, wholesale uh, platform for fashion, working primarily with the luxury companies. Um, in essentially integrating their sales uh, and wholesales with retail. So that'll be next Monday. And then the week after, just as a quick reminder, I'm sure I don't have to do this, but we will not be having in class. I will be um, out of the country. So uh, remember that there is an assignment due um, for your current issues. So that's all the house, cle house cleaning stuff. Let's get started. I'm really excited. This is uh, the second time that we've uh, had this opportunity to do a live recording of the Transition of Style podcast, uh, which is hosted by Corinne Phillips. Uh, it's a podcast that explores the ways in which personal style and queer identity meet. And the podcast is at once uh, personal, informative, uh, always packing an emotional punch. Last semester, we actually had Elliot uh, Sailors here, the model, uh, speaking. So that was our first, first time out. It was such a great um, adventure. Today, I'm very excited to uh, introduce uh, our guest, uh, Danielle Cooper is first, next to Corinne Phillips. Uh, Danielle uh, launched She's a Gent, a blog that celebrates and explores personal style while also using it as a tool to bring awareness to women in menswear. In a very short period of time, She's a Gent has, trans has transformed into a multi-digital publication, which creates visibility for the LGBTQ plus and K or QPOC communities. Um, she's a gent, has been recognized in Forbes, the New York Times, the Huff Post, Out Magazine, Vogue, and Nike. As the founder of a multi-network digital platform that uses fashion as visual acti activism, Danielle is committed to empowering others through content creation and storytelling. Xiao Yang is next to Danielle. Xiao is the founder of The Tailory. The Tailory New York began when she decided to direct her years of fashion, design, and men's tailoring experience towards uh, her own wardrobe. Um, she's a pantsuit aficionado and a lover of men's fashion, uh, conveying the same message of confidence that a perfect custom tailored suit did for men. She likes to bring that to women. Uh, style icons like Sean Connery and Cary Grant, as well as Daniel Craig, are all part of her inspiration. Uh, the Tailory is a custom clothing company that combines modern fashion design with the heritage of custom tailoring. Uh, they live by the notion that your wardrobe should not only fit perfectly, but should be designed with only you in mind. Uh, with impeccable fit, custom design pieces that integrate seamlessly into anyone's lifestyle. So thank you so much, Danielle and Xiao for coming, and I'm gonna turn the time over to Corinne, our host for yes, today. Yes, thank you, thank you guys. Well, thank you for having me back here at FIT, Faces and Places. Um, as uh, Josh mentioned, Transition of Style is a podcast that discusses uh, the intersection of personal style and gender identity. And so today, these guests are a dream come true. I'm gonna try not to do a bunch of gushing up here, because um, <laughs> it's not a good look. Um, <laughs> But I am really excited today because these guys, I, I've been following them both for some time and I, I just cannot wait to start asking them questions. I am gonna read my questions today because I wanna stay on message and stay on topic um, and I don't wanna meander, so I'm gonna read these questions. So if it looks like, you know, a little formal, it's, it's a little more formal, but these guys are awesome and we're gonna, we're gonna get informal at times. Uh, so, Xiao, Danielle, thank you so much for being here. It's, just a, it's a complete pleasure, it's just awesome. Can you guys hear us? Yeah, can you hear us? Can okay. hear us? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> awesome. All right. So, guys, so I want to find out how the collaboration between the two of you guys started. I mean, that's that's the first <laughs> thing I got to ask because you, you guys work together a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, if you guys, you know, at the end of the podcast, we can talk about, you know, how you could find them on Instagram. If you watch, if you go to their each of their Instagrams, you'll see that they are <laughs> kind of sometimes on e each other's Instagram, and yeah. they are doing a lot of things together. And I cannot wait to find out how the collaboration took place. Yeah, so um, I, I started blogging in 2014, and when I started blogging, uh, it was all about personal style, and that came from off the rack. Mm -hmm. And a few months into me blogging, I, so 
one of the things of blogging, it's not just about writing on the blog and then using social media as a tool to get people to the blog, but it's about going out and networking. And so I was networking at an event and came across a brand that Shout actually had worked with, a shoe company, who then introduced me to her. Nice. And that's how we started to kind of forge this relationship. So you started around the same time. I probably started six months before I met you. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? That's yeah, so we met yeah. very early on okay. in our journey. So I think it was like kind of fate. Yeah. It was like meant to be. That's amazing. <laughs> and so Xiao's team then reached out to me. Can you guys bring up said, your mics hey, just you know, a little bit? Oh, come in and yeah. Better? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So um, we wanna co want you to come in, meet us, and, and just kind of share my journey. And it was all about, again, being a woman in menswear. Mm -hmm. And so Xiao loved kind of this, this boss woman show, showcasing suiting. Yeah. And I mean, one of the first women we talked about, uh, we were all on the scandal bench. Yeah, we were, yeah. <laughs> so we were talking about like <laughs> <Still> Olivia Pope, <laughs> like <laughs> that kind of attitude. Right, right, She awesome. wanted, um, she like saw yeah. kind of through my page. So we came together and we started working together um, very organically in the beginning. Right. It was just about her getting pieces on me, yeah. but also educating me on custom clothing. Because mm -hmm. when I came in, I mean, I was wearing men's clothing that I had tailored yes. or taken to yes. a tailor. Yes. Um, and it just, certain things didn't fit properly. Of course. Of course. So then I quickly started partnering with Shao, and the rest is history. But and here's a question. Years later. <laughs> what is the shoe? So you were working with a shoe company? Is no, that we, I wasn't, like, well, we yeah. knew this, we need the founders of this shoe company. Okay. And I think you just met them, you ran into them at an event, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then I think they reached out to me the next day and was like, we met, you know, um, Danielle Cooper, she's a gen, and we think you would really love her, you know, her style and her aesthetic. And I was like, yeah, let's just do it. And like, yeah, and I, I, yeah. I don't want to get too ahead because I know we're going to answer some of these <laughs> questions, but one of the reasons I think that he connected me to Shao is because, you know, again, I'm a woman in menswear. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And a lot of brands don't want to step out of that traditional right. box and right. partner right. with me because right. of that. Right. So Shao saw that and was like, you know what? Let's change the excited. game. Sucks. Yes, I can completely understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, when we had Elliot Sailors here uh, last year, one of the things that we she mentioned that I thought was really interesting was the idea that uh, she said they mentioned is that uh, if a woman models uh, a, a suiting from a men's company, a company mm -hmm. that's run by men, mm -hmm. um, created for men, then men don't want to wear it. They're mm -hmm. like, no, I can't do that. <laughs> A chick wore it, so now yeah. I mm -hmm. can't wear it, which is yeah. kind of crazy and ridiculous. Yeah, you know? I mean, when I when I first started, there was just so much negativity that I got from that because back then people were reposting you, and it's just like, I can just vividly <laughs> remember this one comment, but not to get off topic, yeah, but they me. don't. Yeah. Well, <laughs> 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 the comment basically was like, a woman should be in an apron in the kitchen, not in a suit. Verbatim. Kidding me. No. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's just, me. you know, so okay. partnering with Shao, and her wanting to change this game and really just showcase androgynous fashion or mm -hmm. women in menswear was mm -hmm. like a dream come true. Oh, wow. Kudos to you, my friend. <laughs> Kudos. So to me, it sounds as though um, when I kind of I kind of read your story, it sounded yeah. as though, Shao, that you started t the tailory because you didn't see suits that you wanted. Like there yes, were suits, absolutely. there was suiting for women, but it wasn't the suiting that you wanted. Mm -hmm. That was structured enough that right. you know had the style that you wanted. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk to um, you about, it seems though, you know, especially with your collaboration with Danielle, there's a lot of people in the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. queer community, that are coming to you for suits right now. Mm -hmm. um, so you have come, you've become to be known as somewhat of a, you know, an ally and, and a safe haven for a lot of right. those people. And I'm curious as to, did you see that happening? Because it sounds like you started Taylor thinking, I need more suiting options and right. I need to create those suiting options. Right. But you, did you ever expect it was going to be this? You know, this thing where like now queer people are like, oh my God, I'm flocking <laughs> to this person because I can get a suit. I can get something that's going to fit my body. You know? No, um, I didn't in the beginning. You know, when I was, when I, you know, I've been in the custom suiting game for a very long time. Okay. And when I first started, um, I was one of the only women in a very like male dominated industry. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of, I saw the exclusion in that field because as a woman, they expected you to act a certain way, to represent yourself a certain way, and to dress a certain way. Yeah. And that's just not 
who I am. Right. And I've always um, wanted to challenge that. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten in trouble many times <laughs> for challenging the norm, um, like not wearing heels to work one day wow. because I hurt my foot. What? Um, I actually got sent home. What, I, you were working for a place? I was working for a custom student company, and I was one of the, the heads. I was at the top um, directing and, and designing, and there's a strict dress code in place. And it was always like, oh, you know, women should look a certain way. And heels Whoa. was definitely, Whoa. you know, something that they expected of you. Right. And like, I love heels. Right. Don't get me wrong. Right. I'm wearing heels today. But, you know, I don't feel like I have to wear it just because. Right. Um, so one day I actually hurt my toe and I had to go to the office and I wore flats. It was just Imagine a plain that. flat. And I walked into the, and I remember my boss, he looked at me and he says, what are you wearing today? You're not properly dressed for work. And I say, I hurt my toe. I can't actually fit them in, you know, four inch stilettos. Like oh I, you know, I had to come in. He's like, you can't, you, 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 you're not dressed properly. You have to go home. I was sent home. I was like the first time I ever got sent home for like, not That's wearing a certain, you know, article of clothing or a certain type of shoe. Um, yeah. And, but I saw that and that was not new to me. Like mm -hmm. the, I, the concept wasn't, you know, the idea that it's very exclusionary and like everybody just, uh, it was like a men's club and there was like a certain viewpoint. Um, mm -hmm. But that day I was like, wow, this is, this is real. Mm -hmm. Like this kind of, you know, idea that women need to look a certain way is really real. Right. Um, and that partnered up with the fact that like, I personally love menswear mm -hmm. and I love suiting in general, not that it's menswear, but I love suiting. So with that, like I've always wanted to create a space where people like me who maybe don't fit into the typical norm of what everybody feels like you should be wearing, like right. you can go to somewhere and you can like feel comfortable and be yourself and get something made. That's how, why I started the tailory. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, as you know, I met Danielle like very soon after I started the tailory yeah. and when she told me her story about her struggles in the menswear space and not being able, not being accepted, right? When yeah. you walk into a store and you're like, I'm looking for a certain type of clothing and you get stared at yeah. or yeah. they don't make you feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, that, re that really resonated with me and I think that's when I realized that the tailory had a purpose. You know, and the purpose was to introduce the idea that you can be whoever you want, you can wear whatever you want and there's no gender to clothing mm -hmm. and it's just about expressing yourself in a certain way and yeah. you shouldn't be judged for it. Yes. You know? So like I feel very honored to be an ally and very honored to be able to create, you know, to help my clients and help people um, kind of create their own visual identity and be proud of who they are and like I'm part of that journey. Yes. Um, like everyone's very inspirational to me and yeah. I'm like very happy to be, you know, a part of that. Fantastic. So, I, I yeah, love it. I would you love to continue. Yes, <laughs> please continue. I mean, <laughs> that whole safe haven um, situation is very is very real. I mean, yeah. I I have also experienced walking into you know a menswear uh, a clothing store and getting the stares and getting right. the looks and yeah. you know as if my money somehow doesn't work there, right? You know, which is very strange, you know, yeah. because like it's you like can't shop here. Right? Can I be a patron here or mm -hmm. not? It's like it's the strangest thing, but. Um, so thank you very much for what you're doing because it's it's incredible and it's important. I'm, Danielle, I'm sure you would <laughs> say plenty about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. She's so changed my wardrobe. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> we kind of try to count your suits. I know. Yeah, <laughs> no. you were way off. You're, yeah. you're, you're getting up there. You're getting up there. It's, it's really great. Um, so Danielle, for you, you know, so I've been following you on social media for a really long time, and your your look is always clean. It's impeccable. It's like really nice. Uh, a good, clean aesthetic. Um, so when did you start dabbling in menswear? When did that whole thing start? It's, it's been some years. So I've always been in menswear in some shape or form. Like I was a tomboy growing up. I played basketball all my life. So uh, back then in the 90s, it was a lot about, yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, it was all about like that urban meets athletic leisure meets yeah. oversized, you know, if you, if you know yeah. TLC, yeah. that kind of style. <laughs> um, so in some capacity, I was always yeah. um, in menswear, but it wasn't until I moved to Germany as I, I played basketball overseas, mm. and I was living out there that I got to see European style all day long, ah. and I just fell in love wow. uh, with the, it, it's so sophisticated mm -hmm. and dapper, and the fit is just, it's, the fashion is impeccable. Um, and at that same time, my ex had me watching Keeping Up with the Kardashians. And if you guys know <laughs> Scott Disick back then, 
uh, the boy could dress. I don't know what happened. But I, I, had no, I had no idea your answer would go. I, I was not e into keeping, keeping, keeping up, up with the Kardashians, Kardashians right. but I was. I love Scott Disick. His his style is just flawless. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was around that time that I started to tr transition and really get into proper menswear, yeah, I yeah. like to say. Yeah. Um, and then so over the years, I kind of just started to one piece at a time yeah. curate this wardrobe yes. that turned into this dapper collection of suiting yeah. and, 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 and tailored pieces um, before I met yeah. this one here. Of course, <laughs> yeah. of course. So before you met her though, so you, I would imagine, she she wasn't your first custom suit, I no. would imagine, well, right? No, so she was. She was my first oh custom really? suit. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so before, okay, that's fascinating. Because yeah. I would assume that you had just done some custom suiting um, around and then found Shao was like, nope, I'm stopping here. No. <laughs> this, is, this, is what, this is where I want to live. This is great. Well, it, it goes back to the being comfortable to shop in certain places or, or be in certain houses. And a lot of the custom clothing companies that I knew at the time were all men and they were mm -hmm. just, it, it's right. uncomfortable. Yes, it is. You know, because they're questioning you as to why you want your clothing to f fit a certain way. Yes. You know, why is it that you don't want a really fitted uh, suit yes. with, you know, flared legs? And that's fine for somebody, but I like the way men's suiting looks. Right. I like the cut. Right. Um, so I was shopping off the rack. You know, Top Man was actually my go-to yeah. because of their, the, the variety of sizes that they have. They start all the way down at a s super skinny and then go up to regular. Mm -hmm. So that size fit me, and then I would still have to take it and get it tailored, but it never fit me properly. So a question about Top Man, because that's interesting, because I know they're, you know, I, I style people sometimes and I take them to Top Man for the, for the variety of, s of sizes, but mm -hmm. also because it's a comfortable environment. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have, some of the people working in the, in the shops that I've been at Top Man, mm -hmm. you don't get the questions, you don't get the no. stares, you just, you, they're just shopping, yeah. right? You're just shopping, you're not getting so, so much blowback It's for so being fluid there. in there. Exactly. You know, exactly. and even in, in, even in Europe, and I always think that Europe, or, well in the UK, because that's where I shopped at Top Man, sure. is people don't care what you look like or what you wear. Right. You know, it's just, it's about style. Right. It's not about your gender. Right. Um, but yeah, it was just, they were the only store coming from Europe or the UK that mm -hmm. had the sizes that I need mm -hmm. to fit my body, because I'm, you know, I'm kind of short. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, they're the ones. And yeah. so before then though, so we're talking about just getting things tailored. So you had, you found a tailor that worked with you, yeah. you, were, you were comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the truth is, is like, I, you know, I do style people and I, I would love for everyone just to go get custom, but sometimes they can't all afford it. Yeah, not everybody so, can afford it. So when it. they, you know, until they can, you're t the tailor sometimes your best Yeah, you friend, have right? to find the one that works for you. I got really lucky with finding one around the corner from my house. Oh, wow. Um, it, was, it was actually like a, 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 a cleaning shop meets tailor. <laughs> it was, you know, whatever. But yeah, so so getting the job done. Yeah, <laughs> they fine. got the job done. I went in there. But the unfortunate thing is that your bill racks up really quickly when you're getting your clothing tailored. I mean, you're going to go buy a suit off the rack that's going to cost of X amount of dollars. Of and you have to take it to get tailored. Yes. And I didn't know at the time that in getting it tailored, they're changing and altering the construction of the yeah. suit. Mm -hmm. yes. And so, uh, yes. again, these are a lot of things that I learned over the course of the year working with Shao. But that's why I just say that if it, you know, Shao changed everything. Yeah. It was yeah. like a breath of fresh air. Oh my gosh, that's such a great collaboration. I love it. So Shao, I have a question for you. So in your opinion, <laughs> it seems like there's a shift happening in custom suiting, right? Yeah. Seeing a lot more custom suiting places, it seems like. I, I mean, I, I don't remember seeing as many as we've We've s we're seeing now, yeah. And so I'm curious, like, what? Why do you think that's happening? First of all, and then also, what do you think makes the tailor sort of stand out? I know what makes it stand out. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me what makes it stand out. <laughs> I think people are. C I think they're craving for like individuality. You know, I think people are tired of seeing the same thing happening in fashion, and every fashion house is talking about the same trends. And you know, I think people want to be able to customize and curate their their wardrobe and their identity and their lifestyle a little bit more. So we are seeing a lot more um, custom kind of, not just clothing, it could be custom anything, right? Yes, I think yes. we're starting to see a little bit more of that happening. Um, I think that's a, a great thing. Yeah. Um, yes. So with, I think our approach to custom is a little different than other clothiers. I think a lot of clothiers think about, oh, well, first of all, when they think about custom clothing, the first thing that comes to their mind is custom suits. Mm -hmm. That's like the, uh, as if that's the only thing that can be custom, right? With us, sure. it's a little bit more about um, 
just clothing in general. It could be anything. We could custom anything. It doesn't right. have to be a suit. Right. And with other clothiers, or most of them, they think, um, they think in a very linear way. You know, the process is very linear, and mm -hmm. the, the way they imagine the suit to be is also very linear. Mm -hmm. So they're thinking, okay, you come in, and you pick a fabric, and you pick a lining, and you pick a button, and, <laughs> you know, you pick the style of the suit. And the style of the suit is always very masculine. Right. It's always one particular suit. Right. Um, and that's okay, you know, right. that's what, you know, that's an introduction to custom clothing. If that's what you're looking for, then it's, it's very easy. Um, with us, we try to think a little bit outside of the box mm -hmm. because for us, you know, suiting doesn't have to only derive from menswear. Right. It shouldn't have to be just, oh, the men wear it this way. So as a person in suiting, you have to look a certain way. Right. You know, you can, but there's also a lot of other ways to wear a suit. That's and right. there's a lot of things you can do to a suit that could be completely individual. Yeah. Um, you know, so like, if, I mean, we, we do a lot of very interesting things yeah. at the stage. <laughs> so if you come in and you're like, I want a, a suit with a cape, like, yeah, sure, we can make that. Um, you know, I mean, we yeah. just did a kimono have, have you, suit. Have you had to make that? <laughs> I did have to make that, and it was a lot of fun. I'm dying. I would love to see <laughs> to a photo of that. To figure out, like, you know, That's how amazing. the cape is going to fall That's and, like, how to take off the cape. Um, I love it. You know, that, that kind of, that process is what, makes it super fun yeah. to work with us, you know, like we really listen and we want to make sure we get you something that you truly, truly want. Yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's like, you know, we can do anything. I mean, she's, she's really innovative. I, re I remember <laughs> when we really started to think outside of the box even more, like yeah. take for example, the suit that I'm wearing right now. Yeah. This is traditionally a pinstripe suit mm -hmm. that is vertical, mm -hmm. but she just decided to flip it. Nice. It was just like, why don't we just turn it this way? And so I don't like, know why yes. I did that. Okay. <laughs> why not? <laughs> like, what am I supposed to say? No. <laughs> like, you know, and so she just, she constantly is thinking outside of the box Absolutely. and finding new ways to, uh, you know, change merge it. different fabrics yeah. together, contrast colors, um, you know, just change anything you can mm -hmm. to make it look different mm -hmm. and not recycled, so to speak, against, right. like, things that are off the rack. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely seen you do that. There's no doubt about it. I mean, look, I've had friends <laughs> who come in and, like, ask for something you're like sure we can do that like this yeah i think that's it's kind of like a candy store when you it go is. into tailoring i must say it's we don't like, say no right there's like no, nothing is a no <laughs> everything yeah, yes. everything's yeah. like yeah sure we can do it even if we haven't done it before right you're gonna, we'll you're gonna like, figure it out okay yeah we can do it yeah. well there's always a way right if yeah. you want it done like we'll find a way and we'll make it happen so danielle you must have walked in there and been like oh <laughs> my god so i still get anxiety when i'm trying to pick out a suit like <laughs> A lot of the time, Xiao is finishing the suits, like the details that are inside the lining, yeah. because like yeah. I'm like, girl, I, I need a minute. This is a lot. Yeah. Um, because again, like just looking at the fabrics, it's like, you want me to pick from that? Right. Right. You can, you can have fabric. anything you want. Yeah. That's, you know, it's incredible because I think that um, there's so many people, you know, going and buying stuff off the rack. If you, if that's your own experience with retail, you can get into a situation where you think you can't have what you want, yeah. right? It's really, you, you go, you go, you go to, people go to the tailoring with the mindset of, oh my God, I can have anything. Like they, right. They're they still don't very shocked it. when they come in. I can imagine, <laughs> what, I, I wish you could just, you know, have Polaroids where people yeah. be like, what? Yeah. Like their eyes bugging out of their heads because they're like, they can have whatever they want and like a cape on <laughs> their suit or, or whatever the case is. That's pretty yeah, incredible. Anything. I yeah. think there's also a misconception about the price of custom. Yes. And I'm not right. saying it, it isn't more you expensive. Know, speak, speak to that because yeah. that's, that is something that, uh, like I said, I, I, it is a lot of the people I know mm -hmm. do feel like they are concerned that they can't afford it. So yeah, I mean, and she's going to have to say the prices because I'm going <laughs> to get them wrong. I've been getting them wrong for four years. <laughs> but like, if you are somebody who enjoys designer or something that is of better quality, then you're going to be spending hundreds of dollars on a piece. Like, even if you think of it about a shirt, a button up can cost you, if it's great quality, a yeah. hundred and something dollars. Right. Why not just get it custom? Yeah. You know, just a little bit more than for that. yes, slightly, <laughs> slightly more, and then it does fit you. Yeah. It, it you know in every way it should. Right. Um, but I think that that's what happens a lot of time. That certainly was something for me as I was like, you know, it's just cheaper to get it off the rack, yeah. and like, no, I'll just wait till it goes on sale. But for all that, once I get it tailored, anyways, I just might as well have gotten the you custom suit yeah. well, right. or a right. piece. Okay. You know. okay. Can I can I jump in real quick? So how do you educate your consumer then in term because if they're walking in and it's a candy store, right, right. and it's custom, there's already this idea that it's it could be potentially more expensive. Mm -hmm. What's what's sort of the process that you walk your customer through? 
I think what's really great about our pricing structure is that it's all inclusive, right? So um, once you pick the fabric, that already determines the price of your suit. So however you design it, it's already included. So they don't get super overwhelmed with deciding whether they want this button, if it's gonna be a little extra, right? Everything is included, so it's great. And we always work with our clients within their budget. You know, if they come in, they say, my budget is X, we're not going to like push them towards something that they can't, you know, that isn't within their budget. So we, we have a lot of conversations. It's very transparent, it's very open, and we have conversations to kind of make sure we keep them in budget and we also get them what they really want, you know? And with our pricing, in terms of the industry, we're actually really well-priced. Um, we're very affordable, and it is going to cost, a, you know, a custom suiting is going to cost more than what you would buy off the rack, but it's an investment piece, and it's something that you're gonna have for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And when we work with our clients, we always try to educate them on the fact that, you know, you buy one suit, and that's your foundation. Mm -hmm. And with that one suit, we can always build on top of that suit, and then we can create a very modular wardrobe where you're getting a lot of, a lot of different options for a lot of different events with very limited pieces. So it's yeah. like a lot less waste, but a lot more um, quality in yes. clothing. Yeah. So it's not disposable fashion. It's yeah. not fast fashion that you're investing in, mm -hmm. but you're investing in long-term pieces, yeah. which I think, you know, it's more valuable in the long run. I mean, I'm yeah. sure Danielle can speak to that. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, it's pretty incredible. I'll say this though. I think that people who have tried, like they get a custom piece, whether it's pants or a shirt or anything, yeah. they get, bit by the bug and yeah, <laughs> there's no going back. Of, yeah. right? I also warn people about that too. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, can, you? it, it yeah. can become an addiction. It, it, um. it is, it's an addiction. <laughs> I, I feel like Which I've is good for you, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's a good addiction to have, right? There are, there are bad vices, right. that's, that's, not one, that's not one of them. As, as long as I don't gain weight, I'm good to go. Right. You know. Yeah, you know, that's, that's an interesting, I was thinking about that, so how do you deal with that? Like if people, like, you know, with the custom, uh, with custom pieces, yeah. what if someone, you know, I, I mean, we work with that too. Yeah. Can, you know, we always leave a little allowance in yeah, there. I was wondering. You know, we can open it a little let bit. A little we can take it in a little bit. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'll be that person. Like, I don't want her to let it out yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we get a lot of that too. Like, oh, just I know it's tight, but just give me five weeks, I'll be fine. <laughs> but that's part of the education, right? Because custom really is an ongoing relationship. Right. It's not like you get a it suit is. and then you never see those customers right. again. Right. Yeah. And we see the same. Oh, I'm sure you see the same people over and over again. They got bit by the bug and now they're coming back for sure. You know, they still, I mean, I have clients for like 10, 15 years now, wow. they still call me, um, not to buy a suit, just like, just to ask me, can I wear these pair of socks with these pants? <laughs> or like, I'm really? going to an event, can I wear this tie with a suit? Yeah, it's, it's a relationship, oh, you know, it's, we're building a rapport and, you know, I think I, it's great. I do it as well, and I'm yeah. a fashion blogger. <laughs> but, you know, every now Lo and then lots it's like, of text. I need, you know, I, I, have, I, I, know I need a little advice on this one, you know, I think it works, but just tell me what you right, think. Right. <laughs> But it's that this part also trying to step outside of the box yeah. and do things that yeah. are new and yeah. innovative. Yeah. yeah. Well, that yeah. obviously is what sets Taylor apart from others. So that personal touch is pretty big. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking yeah. about how hard you work and you know how much <laughs> how many hours you spend. Right. You know this one's still like, go home and just go <laughs> to the office and so it's it's uh, that personal touch really means a lot. I, I, I'm gonna imagine your customers really love it. Yeah. You know? I'm very hands on. No, oh, good. I'm awesome. involved with every step. I can see that. That's good. <laughs> it's, it's really good. It's really good. So, Danielle, for you now, I, I want to ask you. Um, so, you're an influencer. You've been doing this for a while. You have been, you know, you've done a lot. You've kind of met with a lot of success doing it. So, tell me about, you know, being a queer woman of color um, as an influencer. Tell me some of the challenges you that you've kind of run into because I can imagine <laughs> yeah. that you can speak at length by some of the challenges. Yeah, you know, they, I mean, there's some great things happening. But I'm sure there's some challenges. Yeah, attached I, to it. when I first started vlogging, actually, I didn't share that I was on the spectrum because I wanted it to just be about fashion. But what I noticed with that is that I'm still a woman in menswear, so people, you know, had an issue with that. I'm not traditional. Um, I vividly remember brands just saying after they had agreed to work with me, mm -hmm. then getting on the phone with me, finally pulling up my account because they don't tend to do that right away, and saying, you know what, actually, we prefer women in women's wear and men in men's wear. You know, whereas I look at fashion as a very non-binary thing. You know, it's just about, it's about clothing. Right. It doesn't really matter how you, um, what, which rack you shop off of. But now as I've evolved, what I've kind of learned is that the issues that I'm having are around 
whether you want to categorize it as race or ethnicity. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, people of color traditionally make a lot less money right. than um, white Americans, if right. we're just thinking in terms of this country. So just kind of giving that pushback as to like why I deserve as much, if not more, mm -hmm. than somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not just about that pretty picture or the, the video that you see, right? There's all these things that I also put into that. Mm -hmm. So trying to educate people on why I am so important mm -hmm. um, has kind of been my struggle over the years. And yes, I've been fortunate, I'm still doing my work and this is my full-time job, right. but there's just constantly that battle of like, I deserve just as much as other people. Right. Um, but yeah, between the two, it's just, it, it has to do with, it's funny actually, because over the last two years, I'm sure you can attest to this, we're trending. Yes, so being a woman of color, yeah. um, being a woman, being yeah. on the spectrum, yeah. you're kind of winning. So yeah. that's yeah. that's working out for me right now. But there's still those people that need to be educated. Interesting. So I mean, it's so y are you finding the, that since we are trending? Yes, it's true. Um, you're having a lot fewer of those uh, those discussions about why you need why you should be getting paid as much. So I'm I'm having less of that conversation and now the other struggle and I don't think that this is something that I just face. I think this is the industry as a whole um, or for for influencers is that educating brands on what we are really doing and why they should be paying us. Mm -hmm. And so like it's really simple. Influencers are the modern day billboard and magazine. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that now you can track right. our work. Right. So when you think about it, if a brand invested into um, into a magazine, they couldn't. They don't know who shopped off of that piece of paper. Right. They don't even know who, who bought it. That's right. You know, That's if right. you if there was a billboard, That's right. How many eyes really saw it? Right. 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 And so now we have those metrics. Right. So I think that that's where like the learning is really coming in now yeah. is saying, hey guys, this is why you should bring me on and, and um, compensate me for my work. Mm -hmm. But not only that, mm -hmm. by bringing me to your brand, I'm widening your audience. Yes. Because for a long time, you were just very one-sided. Now right. you have LGBTQ+, right. women, right. masculine presenting, androgynous, right. same-sex couple, because I'm in a partnership. Right. You know, there's all these other things right. that I can give you, right. and that opens up your demographic even more. Yes. So it's just about constantly educating people on this change of digital media and marketing. I think it's so interesting that you said that you know we're trending or this idea that uh, queer today, especially around gender neutral clothing and just um, gender fluidity. Um, so how do you deal with some of the brands that are kind of queer washing, as a, for lack of a better word, <laughs> that are trying to hire somebody like you to show yeah. that they're yeah. I, I, woke? I'm, I, I love that you said that. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, I really pick and choose. So I tend to do a lot of my research on brands, so it's not just about them queer washing, yes, yes. it's about like really what's your history? Yes. What's your history with women? Mm -hmm. What's your history with minorities as a whole mm -hmm. or um, underrepresented, underprivileged people? Yes. And I look at that before I just go on to the, if they're queer washing or not, but um, it's, it's, it's learning. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't always get it right, but I try to really pay attention. And then I kind of educate brands on, again, going back to why do you really want to work with me? Mm -hmm. Is it that you just want somebody that is queer, mm -hmm. masculine presenting, black, you know, you want to fill all those bubbles, or is it that this is something you were already doing? Because we know in fashion, they work six months to a year out. Right. So were you thinking about this before the trend? Mm -hmm. You know, so again, going back to their history. Mm -hmm. But it's it's constantly just doing my research. It's not always about, uh, it's not always about the money, you know. And if I may, th so it's sort of interesting that the industry is more embracing of, um, you know, the queer perspective. And yet we're seeing these things happen happen with Gucci and Prada. And yeah. I'm just curious what you think about that. <laughs> I mean, what what say? don't it's you think like about that? It's, yeah. it's, it's been challenging when I think about the history um, of this country, when I think about my family, my ancestors. Um, but then on the other t side, I had to step back and not let it personally affect me and think about what normal people don't see. I'm not saying that you guys are normal in here. <laughs> <laughs> but like, most people think that it's just about the sales if you're shopping, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's about the clicks. So the more buzz brands get, i.e. the protesting, mm -hmm. the more sales they're getting. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just rather than, because I was one of those people in the beginning, I was very frustrated, frustrated about what was going on. And then I was like, you know what? How about I don't say anything right. and right. don't contribute to right. that sale? Right. Mm -hmm. right. You know, because if, if less of us protested, 
and paid attention to every little thing. And we were having this conversation early yeah. or yeah. about sometimes, if I'm talking about just the queer community, we're too radical yes. about things that we don't need to talk about. Right. Mm -hmm. So like now if I'm talking about people of color, sometimes if we just take a step back, we would actually not contribute to them making money. Mm. And it's the same thing with H&M. I mean, they had their worst quarter after they put out the um, sweater. Mm -hmm. And that's because people actually were like, you know, we're not gonna go to the store, we're not gonna quit. Right, right, right. I mean, it's funny. So we need to be like less involved. Right, you're right. And that's a good, actually a very good point. And it, it actually I have to go back to Elliot again, um, because it's one of the things that they were talking about was how um, if, you, if you see something you like and you wanna see more of it, then, then speak up about it. Yeah. So this is the complete opposite. Yeah. Right? Don't say a word, no. right? Don't give them the attention, don't give them the clicks, don't say a word, yeah. right? I, I, that's a very interesting, I don't think a lot of people are thinking along those lines. Yeah. They wanna voice their frustration, they wanna let people know this is bullshit, you yeah. know, come on. And that's what, that's the control that social media has over us. Mm -hmm. We see something and we, we wanna be involved because we feel like if we're involved and we're doing the right thing, right. We're, we're activists right. now. Right. But we don't always have to be involved. Right. We can have the conversations like we're having right here and right. it has nothing to do with the brand. Right. Mm -hmm. Not bringing attention to them yeah. in particular. Uh, that's that's really good. Well said. Uh, I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Xiao, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we talked a little bit about this, and I, and I feel like you probably get asked about this a lot. But as a woman in a male-dominated field, like, what would you say to other women? Like, there are not a lot of women who are doing suiting companies. Like, no. what would you? You must have some pearls of wisdom that you can <laughs> pass on <laughs> to, to, to women that are getting into suiting and want to do. Um, just to kind of get into that business, what would you say, what, what is a really good piece of advice that you'd give to them? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, well, why did I start it? But you um, knew it was coming up. I knew it was coming, <laughs> yes. I, you know, I know it sounds really cheesy and cliche to say, <laughs> but like, don't give up. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. if you really believe in your idea, if you really believe in this concept, like I really believed in this woman's wear, um, tailored clothing, custom clothing company for women, like I really believed it. You're, you know, if you believe something, you're the constant. Yes. So you're the one that has to fight for it. So you can't give up. You have to keep going. And in, and it doesn't just apply to, you know, if you want to start a suiting company. I think it's in general, if you want to do something, you're going to have failures. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a lot of naysayers. You're going to have people that's going to doubt you. But you have to be the constant. You have to just tell yourself, like, I believe in this. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to, you know, fight through anyone that's going to tell me that it's not possible. Right. You so know? I'm guessing you had your moments where you're like, oh boy, like. Oh yeah, can I do of course. This? Like I mean, you're. <laughs> I mean, I made tons of mistakes. You yeah. know, I mean, there's a lot of things I did wrong, but that's, you know, but I remain true, and I know the what I want to do. And like I said, like I feel like there's a purpose with the mm -hmm. tailoring now, mm -hmm. so I'm going to keep you know, working those long hours yeah, and keep yeah. making those same mistakes. I mean, not the same mistakes, but keep making mistakes yeah. and learning from those right. mistakes. Some mistakes. Yeah, it could be, <laughs> you know, I hope not, but you know, like that's, you, you have to stay, you know, in it. Yes. You know, so that's, that's what I would say. We glossed over this a little earlier, but you mentioned you can kind of do anything, but that doesn't come without learning a craft, especially when it when you're talking about tailoring. Yeah, of course. And so you, you should <laughs> know your craft, of course. Don't start something you don't know anything about. <laughs> but, you know. Um, then again, that's why YouTube exists. That's true. <laughs> I'm speaking about that in a very digital right. way. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, yeah, I I love tailoring. I've learned a lot of, I went to design school, you know, mm -hmm. there was a part of, it's been a part of me mm -hmm. and it's always going to be, you know, so. Don't start if you don't want to do it. <laughs> it's not. It's not easy. It's an investment too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so Danielle, for you. Um, so you know, as someone who has been following your work on social media for a while, it, I think you, it's safe to say, uh, definitely for my listeners, that you're you're an inspiration for a lot of them. I Thank mean, you. they see what you're doing, and you're you're bringing representation and visibility to them in a way that. Um, is just not seen often, um, so it's it's um, amazing to have you doing what you're doing. But I'm curious about like with your style. So I'm sure that when you first started, you know, wearing menswear, did you feel like it was more attached to your identity? Like, were you buying clothing because you're like, 
this is clothing that I feel looks good on me and because it's of the, uh, my identity. Yeah. And, and if that's the case, would you then say that now it's not so much about your identity but about your style? Because you have great style. So Thank you. I'm curious that like how things have changed over time when you first started as opposed to now. Yeah, um, so I came out like pretty late. I came out when I was like 21. So when I was first dabbling with menswear um, and kind of that like sporty urban athleisure yeah, way, yeah. It, it, I felt like I needed to be in menswear. Yes. Um, and, and, and when you're wearing like urban clothing again, like back then in the mm -hmm. early 2000s, there was a certain style and it just didn't exist yeah. in, in most women's um, collections. So back then I think so, as I started to shift into suiting, because I was very uninformed and uneducated on the world of like suiting itself, mm -hmm. I thought that I, if I wanted to have that style, yeah. I had to shop menswear because there wasn't another option. Like mm -hmm. most designers, even if you're thinking about some of your like uh, low cost mainstream designers, like a czar or yes. something, yes. their women's collections are still very feminine. Yes. So I didn't have that option. So I shopped menswear like your top mans, your H&Ms at the time, because that's all I had. Right. Um, and uh, along the way, kind of around the time that I first met Xiao, another influencer showed me that women's collections or designers were starting to make women's suits that were like that boyfriend mm, style. Mm -hmm, right. So I would start to wear those right. with like jeans or trousers, but they never made the collection with match matching pants. And if they did, they were very feminine. So okay. again, I was, I, I, I was forced right. in a sense to kind of buy mm -hmm. menswear and then meeting Xiao mm -hmm. slowly but surely mm -hmm. I, started to dabble with, I guess you can just say custom because there's yeah. no <laughs> gender attached to right, this. Right, yeah. right. Um, but, so now, but now it could be about your style though, right? Yeah, so, so now, now- you can go to Shao and get something that you're just like, this is made for my body, now I can play with this. Yeah, and so- I can have fun. So what happened was is that I would, I still do buy pieces that are menswear specific and it, it more so is for comfort for me. So I don't like certain things <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't like when my shirts like nope. are in They're my laughing armpit. because I have a feeling yeah. that they know arm about Yeah, the armhole. <laughs> okay, she <laughs> always <laughs> corrects me, but like I just don't like shirts sitting up there. Yeah. I've never liked it, even when I was wo wearing wo women's wear, I thought I was supposed to wear <laughs> women's wear. Um, so I shop certain pieces just because you can't make everything custom. Right. Um, right. Right. But apart from that, like Shao just kind of allowed for my identity to resonate through my clothing yes. by having it fit a certain way. Mm. Yeah, okay. so now it's just, I really try to, I don't I'll always throw it out there because I don't need to overshare right. about like non-binary clothing, but right. that's how I look at clothing. Like there's no label. Right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you're wearing. Of and most of my closet, honestly, 90% or more is all women's wear. Really? Yeah. Even if you think about my suits, like this pattern is a ma men's pattern, but it's construction constructed for me, a woman. Um, and it has, you could speak to this more, of course, <laughs> the, like, you know, the curves and the certain, details yeah, right. so that it fits a woman. <laughs> right. um, but all of my clothing, for the most part, all of my jeans, women's, it's, but it's how I wear it. Yeah, you mean, know. You, it looks great. Thank you. My shoes, because I can't fit women's sho men's shoes, they just, they don't but come down to a size that's a five or they gotta, six. They gotta, they gotta work they on that a little bit. They need to. Yeah, they, they gotta work on that. Or create a line that's like, this is a men's takedown, but. There's the, so few. There's yeah, so few. I mean, they're, they're just too expensive. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a six and a half in men's. I'm like a, a half a size away from a world of men's shoes yeah. that mm -hmm. kind of puts me in tears every time I think about <laughs> yeah. it. I was like, oh I know, God. I know. Half size. I, that we is like one question I time. get. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. If, if if I don't get more DMs on shoes and where <laughs> I can buy them from, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> any particular yeah. shoes? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, because like when you're wearing a suit, you want the shoe to reflect right. that, of course, right? Of course. And so most women's shoes, even if it's a takedown from a man, like the tongue is still up there, and it's like it just—it's not the same look. It's just not the same look. Not as good. Not so as yeah. Good look. yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, I think I'm ready for you to go ahead and should we open it up to questions? Over. Yeah, <laughs> turn right. it over to our friends here. So if you don't mind, here at the end to grab that mic. All right, who would like to ask the first question? Perfect. <laughs> I just wanted to ask about how you started up, like a specifically tailor-made like uh, business like that. Like how do you build a client base from scratch? Did you start with bloggers and stuff like that? Um, or did you start at home? Well, I, I, I had a following already before I started my own company, but I was working in custom suiting for a long time. 
and I think if you are genuine and you build a relationship with the people that you work with, they're going to go and follow wherever you go because it's that, it's that relationship. So when I, I was fortunate enough that when I started, I had a lot of my clients come with me and also um, working with them and then meeting their friends and then their friends' friends. So it's a lot of word of mouth and a lot of referral base. Mm -hmm. And you know, and then working with Danielle, and then she opens up a whole new world for me. So yeah. I think I was, it's about the relationship. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how you got started, sort of where you went to school and ended up in design? Um, I went to Parsons. I studied mm, women's wear. That's why you didn't mention it. <laughs> it's okay. We, we still like you. <laughs> um, I, I studied uh, traditional women's wear. Mm -hmm. And that's because they didn't offer menswear <laughs> at Parsons. And See, you should have come to FIT. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That was, you know. Um, and I started, um, my first job out of school was at a evening wear company. And, you know, everybody thought that was so glamorous and, like, beautiful, like, gowns and whatnot. Um, but I didn't do the gowns. I did the mother of the bride suiting, oh. which was the one job nobody wanted <laughs> but I loved it because I thought you know I really love tailoring so when I was working um, in this department that nobody wanted to work at it was like great for me because I got to learn tailoring I got to learn how to tailor a perfect suit on anybody mm -hmm. you know because mother of the bride you know department wasn't about like you know a size zero <laughs> six feet tall model you know it was like real moms yeah. and that was really exciting for me and I took that and I took that experience with me and took that to um, other custom clothing houses. Um, but what I learned with the other custom clothing places was that they didn't cater to women, mm. you know? And I wanted to, I really wanted to bring that to the industry. Um, and it just wasn't, it wasn't available and everybody shot me down. But that's why I'm here. <laughs> it's interesting. So. All right, other questions? All right. So this one's for Danielle. Actually, I've been following you for a while, and um, I'm kind of trying to break into that whole segment of like social media and Instagram of like non-binary, like gender fluid fashion. And you're like consistently someone who like is on like the top posts for that kind of category on Instagram. So like, I had no idea. <laughs> how do you? No how idea. did you like? <laughs> how do you like? start that sort of networking like what are the kind of events that you go to to get yourself out there yeah. um as like a non-binary i don't know style yeah. yeah yeah um i think now it's you you're kind of in a like better pl position than i was back then because you have places like conde nast opening them you have um outlets like dapper q you have um Curve map. There's so many different um, outlets out there. The Fluid Project. So you have to kind of just follow who is doing what. Research it. Honestly, what I did um, when I first started, I kind of would type in what events are out there because Google, honestly, is your best friend. And Ebright. There's always like those events out there. And Facebook. Facebook offers a lot of groups. And I would just go. You know, um, I would always bring a friend with me because in the beginning I was really shy, so I needed somebody to break the ice for me. But it's just about going to these different networking events and finding people and chatting with them about what you like. And then just, if you said you already, do you already have a page? Yeah. Okay, share your style. Find the hashtags that work for you because there's one thing about social media is that everybody's always watching. Yeah. Even people you don't think are watching at like top publications are watching. So use the hashtags that best resonate with you and just share it, share what you love. Thank you. No problem. It's Good so advice. interesting that you said that you have to be social or there's that part of aspect because yeah. so much of what appeal is appealing to, to social media is that you can kind of hide behind it, yeah. so to speak. So can you talk a little bit about more about that because that's so fascinating about how this, this job really is being out there and engaging and networking in a, in a very physical way. Yeah, I mean, you want to create those relationships, right? So like you can send emails, talk via DM or social, all day long, but once you connect with somebody in person, this is what kind of happens. Yes. Like outside of Shao, all of the brands, PR, um, publications that I've connected with, it's because I've gone to the events, introduced myself, even if it's just like, a, hi, I'm Danielle, this is what I do, and I don't talk to them for a year. They'll remember me just because I introduced myself, because a lot of people like, 
tend not to. They hide mm -hmm. behind the social. And like, uh, like you said, I think it's because it's kind of safer for a lot of us in the space that we're in. It's more comfortable. Mm -hmm. But there's somebody out there just like you at these events. And I've befriended so many people just because I've gone out there and connected. But it's all about bu building real relationships. And I think sometimes social takes that away from us. Very much. Um, it strips yeah, what we were much. created to do, and that's to be social and to kind of like take things from one sure. another and inspire one another. Hmm. How do you uh, take, now that you've been doing this for so long and it's become your career, how do you take all the data and turn that into something that is sellable, that you can go and say, I'm worth X amount of dollars for this campaign? Yeah, um, it's been a process. When I first started, this was li literally just for fun. Like, I was still working a nine to five. Um, so one thing kind of just led to another, and what I found, it's all about consistency. That was the first thing I learned when I started. And if we're talking just about, like, Instagram, the game has changed, the algorithm has changed everything. Mm -hmm. So when I first started, it was literally about posting every single day so that people would see you. It's like when you think of Google and the SEO, the more you share, yes. the more you're going to yeah. be seen. Um, but now it's kind of just about creating, curating something that's mine. Mm -hmm. So what I would say about like social and what's helped me sell myself is that my niche is my niche. I don't step outside of that. So you guys aren't going to see me, not that I don't enjoy it, but like see me flaunt urban attire or better example, you'll never see me in a dress and heels. Mm -hmm. It's not me. Um, <laughs> so I stick true to what my niche is and that's primarily suiting. Yes. It's travel yes. and it's also like my partner, like yes. slowly introducing yes. who she is. Yes. And so what I think that between it, curating a very artistic page and consistently still posting on my blog, because for those that have a blog or other channels, like Instagram isn't everything. Right. That is not why I got into this. Right. It just so happened that I got lucky with that and then it mm -hmm. blew up. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I still share on my blog because that is why I started. It's, mm -hmm. it's really personal for me. Mm -hmm. um, but it's being consistent. Uh, I do recommend having something like a blog or a platform that is yours. Consistently, I mean, sorry, curating your niche and standing for that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then don't be afraid to reach out to people. I still reach out and say, hey, even if this is for something gifted or I'm going to travel and I want to stay with you, like introducing yourself. Mm -hmm. um, not everything is paid for, my, for me, but I have been very fortunate and lucky that because of the story that I've consistently told, uh, that is also different than somebody, so many others that I've been able to grow. Mm -hmm. Other questions, right next. Um, Aisha, I have a question about your shop, the way that you kind of run your business. Do you find that some clients aren't exactly sure what they want? So do you offer any kind of samples, like to see what a double-breasted would look like, or yeah. different shapes, or is it all kind of from scratch? Um, actually, a lot of our clients come in not knowing what they want. <laughs> That's the beauty of going to custom shops is you can kind of talk out the concept and get that item made. Um, we have seasonal collections that we put out um, twice a year. So with that collection, when a client come in, they, they can see a lot, of, a lot of samples. And from those samples, they can kind of tell me what they liked about it, what, th what they liked, what they didn't like, and then we can curate something based on that. So, so is that ready to wear then, too? Is it kind of like people could buy off the rack that, that way, or is it just it's like a sample? More it's just samples. samples. It's okay. not ready to wear. So we don't produce it to sell. Um, we just produce it as inspirational pieces. Right. So a little more made to measure. Yeah, yeah. it's very custom. How much did you have to learn about, because I know not all of your customers are, are LGBTQ, mm -hmm. how much did you have to sort of learn about that space when you started to realize that there was that real connection that was happening? I learned a lot from Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> She's your guru. Yeah. And the yeah. floodgates opened up. <laughs> and it's, it's, you know, we, we actually talk almost every day yeah. and we meet up, you know, very often. So we all, these are like normal conversations that yeah. we just naturally have. And things that arise, you know, in on social media or arise in the space or in our daily lives, we always constantly talk about it. Yeah. And I think that daily conversation is, you know, how I, I'm like so immersed, yeah. you know, and it constantly growing. I mean, I think just like us up here, like we're constantly even still learning about yeah. the space. Mm -hmm. You know, even the extension, if I think of something like pronouns, that's not mm -hmm. something we were using no. when right. I was in college. So, neither. you know, just <laughs> yeah. evolving mm -hmm. together. We're very honest with each other and open about what's going on. Do you think uh, there was a, a, an article in the New York Times not too long ago about 
brands that are starting to have gender neutral tri uh, fitting yeah. rooms and things like that. Um, why do you think it's taken so long for brands to sort of think about clothing less gendered and think about it more as, a, as you said, an open space where anyone who has money can buy what they want? Right, exactly. I should think this one. <laughs> <laughs> I have my thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, being in fashion for so long, the, this whole concept really is very new. You know, and like even when I was going to school, right, like it was, do you want to study women's wear or do you want to study right. men's wear? Right. It wasn't just, do you want to study fashion design? Mm -hmm. You know, it was very divided and it has always been. Um, and, it, and it's very exciting to see, you know, fashion starting to evolve and people starting to understand that at the end of the day, clothing is just clothing and design mm -hmm. is design and creativity is creativity and there shouldn't be gender associated with it. And I, People are starting to understand that, and I know a lot of brands are doing it because it's a trend, mm -hmm. and they're doing it because they want more sales. Yeah. But I think that's that's very um, obvious. It's very transparent. Like you can see that. You can yeah. tell when a brand is just doing it because it's what's trending right now, and it's not really part of their DNA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. And I think we try a lot to make sure that people that we work with, people that we partner with, and things that we get involved with has that authenticity yeah. to it. it. Isn't just oh, I just want to be cool. Yeah. or trendy or you know and I also think that this is when like the protests have been good mm -hmm. yeah. you know whether it's people out in the street mm -hmm. you know grassroots or if it's mm -hmm. done on digital mm -hmm. it's you know we're fighting back we're taking a stand that we need to move forward right. and evolve mm -hmm. as a you know as as a as a country, as a world, as a community. Yeah. Society, exactly. Society, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I know the word, I can't get it out. So many I thoughts. I got the word, don't so worry about it. <laughs> but you know, so I, I do, you know, I do get people that I help style sometimes, and what I always, I'm finding more and more, are there people who are, don't present as masculine, there are women who don't present as masculine, mm -hmm. and they don't like what they have in, in terms of um, options for suits. Yeah. You know, so I, the fact that the tailor exists, is really important because I think that it's funny to me that they can go into a store and they're women and they can go to the men, the women's uh, department and they mm -hmm. still can't find what they're looking for. No, because they can't I, find it. No, you know it doesn't it doesn't exist for them. Yeah. So the I always feel like the construction too with women's clothing yes. for some reason is always subpar. Yeah, it's yeah. never as good as the construction. I completely know, agree with that. Like. Pockets, for example. I completely agree with that. <laughs> There's no pockets on right. women's wear. It's 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 or it's like, like we don't jean need pockets, it. Like right. Stops. It's like right. super small. Like, yeah. Just for your little, we got to get you to buy bags. Detail. That's the thing, right? <laughs> right. So get you to little buy bags. details like that really bothers me. Yeah. Um, I see why. Right. Yeah. And yeah. the canvassing on a jacket, you know, a traditional jacket always has canvassing in the lapel and in the front chest. With if you buy even very expensive women's yeah. suiting. Yes. It's like lining, a fusing, and a fabric. Mm -hmm. There's right. no construction, right. you know, as if like we don't deserve to yeah. have that. Um, so yeah, so I, I really, you know, tried, w when we were creating suiting here, you know, ev the way we create a man's suit, right. you know, is the same as the way we, right. I mean, all the suits, it's all the same of our kind suits of construction. are created it's the, same the same exact way. Yeah, yeah. with the canvas and all Everything, that. Everything, yeah. pockets, exactly. canvas. The pick stitching. Like, why shouldn't it be there? It's <laughs> the monogram. I mean, it, it's it's it took a while for me to get that this was a woman's suit. I was like, no way. This is a man's suit. That's, that's just what it is. <laughs> like, I'll call it whatever. Yeah, it's, only, yeah. Yeah, it's only because, you know, we all know, like, to fit, a, you know, bodies is different. Right. So, right. with Danielle suits, it was, we had to give her the style that she wanted, right. but also needed to fit her. Right. You know, right. so we play around with the patterns to. And you guys deal with bodies. That's what you deal with. That's yeah. what's so great. Yeah. You're just dealing with bodies. We're just, All types you'll of have bodies, right? <laughs> we don't have, it's not a gender, it's a, it's a body. Right? And right. designers in mainstream don't think about that. Not it's at just all. like, this is no, for them, this right. is for that. That's and you don't think about the shape. Right. And you know, the bust That's and right. all this and that, whether you're a man right. or a It's a shape. Yeah. It's, a, it's just a shape. That's all it is, right? Yeah. At the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? You're so shy today. It's been mesmerized. I know. Like ask away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so then I'm gonna take it over then. Um, so, as a uh, takeaway, um, I'm gonna ask you both um, a question. I won't get crazy. <laughs> <laughs> See the look. She's like, don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something I ask um, uh, pretty much everyone on my on my uh, podcast. 
and answer in whatever way you want. There are no wrong answers, and I'll let you go first. So you can think about it. Because well, um, <laughs> you can, you <laughs> you've got an answer already. I can feel it. <laughs> so we, the question. You guys talked about this. <laughs> we, <laughs> well, okay. So what what are the things that we talk about in the podcast? Is, and it's really important to um, stress the importance of authenticity. The, mm -hmm. the the importance of people just living their lives in a way that feels very authentic to them. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to use pronouns, great. Use pronouns. If you don't want to, you don't have to. If you, you know, if you have this identity and it's something completely separate from anything you've ever heard of before, then fine. But what is it that you do that makes you feel like you? And so I usually ask the question, um, I ask people to, uh, to c complete the sentence, I feel most authentic when? Yes. Seriously? <laughs> Seriously, yes. <laughs> You got this. I feel so that you, could, you could take a moment. I feel like there's so much you could say. Come I, on, I so know. Easy. Start thinking. <laughs> now I'm thinking <laughs> here. Thank you. Damn it. Do you want me to do it first? <laughs> yeah, you go okay, ahead. Great. I'm going to go first. And now, now you have time to think. Um, okay, so I think I feel most authentic when I am doing this right now. When I'm having conversations with people, when I'm connecting with them, and we're talking about usually these types of topics, but in general, just talking to someone and listening to them and having a really authentic uh, com conversation about life, about their struggles, about their their history, this is when I feel most authentic because I feel like I'm really there with them. We're having this really good, authentic like interaction. Can I just say that's my answer? <laughs> I was just you gonna can. say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, but I don't thing. believe it. <laughs> yeah. um, it could, you know, it could yeah. be an activity. It could yeah, be like I honestly, I dressed. feel, I feel most authentic in so many dis different ways and spaces. It depends on the day, you know. Okay. So I feel most authentic when I'm in the gym. Okay. Why? Because I was an athlete first. Yeah. Like yeah. I am a basketball player. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel most authentic when I'm in a suit because it's like my, it's it's yeah. my costume. It's yeah. like my superhero. Yeah comes out, I feel yeah. like, you know, yeah. doing one of those. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's my, my armor all the way. Awesome. Um, and honestly, I feel most authentic when I'm, m my slogan or my line is be free enough to be you. So like, I'm gonna connect this all in one sentence, but I feel most authentic when I'm free enough to be myself mm -hmm. yeah. with my partner walking down the street. That's awesome. Good answer, see? You, know, you can handle I it. I had one in the back pocket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had a feeling. <laughs> Shout. It's gonna not gonna be uh -huh. so hard. It's gonna be easy. <laughs> Putting me on the spotlight. Okay. It's, it's, you know. Um. You. I mean. I'm gonna. It's what you guys said, <laughs> right? Like I. I think I'm very proud to be who I am, mm -hmm. and I'm happy who I am. So I'm authentic when I'm just being me. Yeah. You know. Yeah. When I'm doing like uh, people that know me know that like I. Yes, I am very shy. <laughs> but when I'm just like in my own space, like I'm crazy and goofy and yeah. silly and you know I never filter what I say yeah. you know, there's a lot of time I say the wrong thing <laughs> but it's okay because it's me um, but in the context of like fashion yeah. I definitely feel the most authentic when and the most passionate when I am in the working zone with working with the client and really being able to like curate and design something for them that they never thought they could have you know, or helping them create their idea, like their visual identity, helping them tell the world how they see themselves, right. you know, and being able to help them tell that story, like that's really important to me. Yeah. And that's when I feel like the most authentic and passionate and like, like I do the right thing. This is what I want to do. And, you know, I made the right choice to leave my job and start this on my yes, own and yes. struggle through it every yes. day, All you right, know? See? So that's a fantastic answer. I love that <laughs> answer. Thank you. You gave, you gave me like some time but to think I, about I, it. I, I did that on purpose <laughs> for you. Um, but I, you actually have one more question for you yeah. because um, someone asked about like when someone comes to you and they don't know what they want. Mm -hmm. What kind of questions do you ask them? Like simple questions. Yeah. Like what, what do you things ask like them? what's your favorite color? Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. Like what do you wear? What do you want to wear the suit? Yeah. Where is it? What is it for? Yeah. You know. Um, and that's you know these very simple questions, as simple as they may sound. Like gets them really comfortable, mm -hmm. and they start talking. And then before you know, we're having like hour-long conversation about their life and what they're doing on the Very weekends. Cool. And well, well you know. I think the 
office, and yeah. you also serve alcohol. So I just definitely saying. serve and macaroons now. Something. Maybe a little something. <laughs> maybe a little something to do. <laughs> so it, you know, and um, I mean, you guys have never been to my space, but I have a very intimate studio space. You know, it's almost like walking into your friend's living room. You know, it's very small, it it's comfortable, it's nice, there's yeah. like great it music, nice. great lighting. And I do that on purpose because I want it to be a safe space. I want it to yeah. be a comfortable space. You know, I want you to be able to walk in and feel at ease mm -hmm. because it's not always easy to talk about, you know, your own insecurities with the way you look or your body or not being able to find what you want. Right. And to be able to go to the space and sit down and work one-on-one -on -one with someone and talk to them about everything and, and then at the end walk away with, you know, confidence yeah. and a beautiful piece that yes. you like dreamed about. Like yes. that's important, yes. you know. Yes. So fantastic. Oh. And mm -hmm. and for some of your listeners, yes. because uh, you said that they follow me. <laughs> yes, they definitely follow you. If <laughs> <laughs> they definitely <laughs> follow. I you. get really bashful. Can you <laughs> not? <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Just the honest <laughs> truth. That's all. <laughs> but a lot of people tend to come in and say they want a suit like mine, or I right. want Danielle's that's look. That's so great. you have to that's great. still know though right. why you want that suit right. because. Mine is very much off of European style, so it's yes. very fitted. Okay. So if you're somebody that doesn't want a fitted suit, right. make sure you have all of those answers and questions for Shah. She'll ask them as I'll well. I'll ask them too. Like yeah. You know, like we do get a lot of clients that come in and say, I want to look exactly like Danielle. And I always ask them, like, why? Right. <laughs> you know, right. why? It's a good and question, what though. what it's is a good it question. about Danielle's suit that you like? Is it. You know, is it the style of the suit right. or is it how it fits her? Right. Because those are very different things. Exactly. You know, fit's very personal. Right. Um, how it fits on her, if I do it on the client, yes. they might not like it. Right. You know, so that's those, you know, we uh, we have very extensive conversations about all of that before we even get to the, the measuring part. We do that last right. for a reason. Right, right. You <laughs> make them feel comfortable, which is yeah, the biggest, you know, it's the big piece there, you know? Awesome. Good, good answer. <laughs> <laughs> the great answers. I love them. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I think we're going to wrap up. Um, yeah. But thanks, guys, for listening today. This yeah, was awesome. Thanks thank for you for having us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so thrilled to have you guys. This is really wonderful. We're going to have to do a part two. We're doing yeah. a part two. Okay. We'll do a part two. Yes. Wh 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 whiskey okay. and That's when the whiskey's happening. <laughs> 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 a little Grey Goose for me. I like the skinny girl. <laughs> Just kidding. We, we have that Grey Goose for you. <laughs> thank you so much, Corinne, for hosting today. It was so nice to sit back and kind of watch that today. <laughs> Usually I'm in the driver's seat. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Shao, for thank coming. You. It was really a pleasure. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.